Right, perspectives on high performance computing in the big data world, part C. This is Jeffrey Fox here. This is a talk given at the 28th uh, version of HBDC in Phoenix uh, this year. And um, in this part, we'll do our first discussion of machine learning for HPC. And let's go. So we focused on what I call ML around HPC and ML auto tuning, starting actually with the ladder. Although we're going to be focusing on ML auto tuning and ML around HPC, let's actually define all the um, ML for systems or ML for HPDC slash HPC possibilities. ML after HPC is a very important area. It corresponds to using machine learning to analyze the results of HPC, uh, HPC simulations, such as traject finding trajectories of molecular simulations, or the structure you get out from a simulation. This is very well established and very successful. Um, there are packages like CP trash and MD analysis that we use to, to do that. ML control is another important area which we won't discuss. Use, well, we'll discuss it just very briefly. Uh, using simulations with HPC and machine learning of, on the data to control experiments. Here, the simulation surrogates are very valuable, which are part of ML around HPC, because they can give you much quicker predictions and allow you to real time uh, control experiments such as the Tokamak, which is you know, you want to steer clear of um, unstable situations and then what recognize that quicker than having to run a full simulation, which is obviously not practical for a real time practical system. All right. Uh, first, I just mentioned a brief survey I did on the field uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And um, it's at this uh, website here. And also on my, it's just on the publication list for our research group. It goes over, it looks at somewhat over 100 citations. It was actually originally done for BDEC, the Big Data Exascale Computing Initiative. And it's focused mainly on M, these two topics, ML around HPC and ML auto tuning. And if we looked at the areas which uh, came up, there was actually not so much on computer science. The full list has some papers from on that area such as those on how to do uh, find errors in neural in machine learning and uh, other aspects of the computer science it has not so much actually on partial differential equations it has a lot on particle dynamics and some on agent based simulations we're going to come to look at agent based simulations later on cuz they are in some sense the most promising area to look at i mean actually particle dynamics is already re totally revolutionary but uh, there, that's already well established. Agent-based simulations are a comparatively smaller group of simulations. And machine learning for agent-based simulations of this type we're going to discuss is particularly promising because agent-based simulations are intrinsically data-driven. Because they correspond to fields like uh, biology, bio computational systems biology, or um, Socio-technical simulations like transportation, terrorist groups, things like that, which intrinsically are based on data. There are no Newton's laws for terrorist um, organizations, and um, no fundamental equations. And so, having a more um, sort of less fundamental approach, which the machine learning learns the answers. Well, that may be more natural for this problem. But anyway, it's actually incredibly important in particle dynamics, but that we'll look at both biomolecular cases and more actually on nano simulations, which are closely related. And we'll see smart something, effective potentials, um, learning surrogates, and so on. And um, we will discuss at the end, how, and actually in the next section, of the, of the talk, how we uh, propose to develop a new approach to computational systems biology. That's with some colleagues at Indiana University and other, other places. Here are the nine ML around HPC scenarios. Uh, obviously, these pictures are too small and daunting to discuss. In here, it's um, the green is some input, 
and the blue is some output, and they cover various things. And this thing here where we have all the hardware and software blue, that's when we're doing configuration, that's ML auto tuning. Here we have um, just multiple simulations and one of them is blue. That's why we're using smart machine learning to predict uh, smart data sampling, smart ensembles. Um, here we have, um, we are fitting data to model. We have some green observational data, and then the first point of the trajectory, the initial values are given by machine learning, and so on. I don't want to go through these nine cases here. I will go through most of them in the following slides. Those I don't go, go through are actually present in a longer presentation. All right, so let's first start with the simplest case, which was the top left of the previous diagram, ML auto-tuning HVC, learning configuration. So this uh, auto-tuning is very well established and used um, uh, to, to choose like optimal, optimal parameters, optimal block sizes for matrix arithmetic and things like that. Um, and uh, they're also, of course, used to configure big data systems and they typically done by running examples initially, or, or learning on the fly as you run things. What the how the how the setup is uh, optimized, and obvious and uh, this include both initial values and also as we'll see later, dynamic choices such as uh, step sizes in space and time. It could also include discrete choices as to the type of solver or the type of machine learning to use. Here is an example with I, I was collaborated in a slightly minor fashion with the work done by my uh, collaborator, a uh, junior faculty in, in nanoengineering at uh, Indiana University. And we're doing, um, we're running uh, simulations to um, look at um, ions near polarizable nanoparticles. Here are ions and here are nanoparticles and uh, polarized, and <coughs> you run in simulation in blocks and use the machine learning to optimize at the end of each block. And um, so we can show how that works, it works better. Okay, here's some uh, results of, a tip of some of the runs here. And they show that uh, using this dynamic machine learning to optimize the, uh, the system is producing good results. Let's look at this one here first, the uh, progress in time uh, by changing dynamically the time step, which obviously you're doing molecular dynamics, you can change the time step. If you change it, if you make it too big, you'll get inaccurate answers. And if you make it too small, you'll just spend too much time. And uh, the default here is, uh, this is in, in the microseconds. A uh, millionth of a nanosecond is the default time step. That's this uh, progress shown here, which gets you to, in two million um, computational steps, gives you a nanosecond of simulated time. With the dynamic choice of um, time step, you can do three times better than that. And these are just different choices of the machine learning. And here's the, the brown is the optimal value. And um, Actually, this particular program gets the speed up of three then for the auto tuning and the maximum speed up of uh, 600 in that it also does parallelization, which gives you a factor of 200. And if you look at, um, there is a, this does a self consistent calculation <coughs> with a parameter mu which needs to be adjusted, and that is adjusted dynamically by the machine learning. And the, whereas it's non-adaptive, it's the green, and the adaptive is the red. That red, which is represented by everything except this green curve, these red results show uh, very robust, stable results, which is what you want for um, uh, correct, reliable computation. And so actually this machine learning gives you more reliable computation, because it <coughs> gives you robust choices for the basic parameters. Here we have this one I already mentioned, smart ensembles. 
where we uh, use machine learning to, to, to produce uh, ensembles uh, where we're trying to explore a phase space, such as in weather forecasting or other, other um, ways we want to try to understand the types of answers we can get from a problem. Here we have learning model setups from observational data. It comes when the simulation is set up as a set of agents, in such an agent-based simulations. And we're tuning the agent parameters to optimize uh, their effectiveness for a given set of observational data. This is a very time-consuming area for currently in this agent-based simulation arena. And it uh, seems reasonable to um, Expect the use of more sophisticated machine learning techniques, which we will actually expand in the predictor corrector method to do it not as a single time step, single initial time, but also as a function of time. This looks particularly important. And we need to develop effective machine learning for this case. Here we have um, the first of the surrogates. So these are very important, learning the output from the input. So the simplest variant of a surrogate is you specify the input by a few parameters. And you get out the output uh, done with averages and extreme values in a few parameters. So we call that computational results from computational defining parameters. Learning outputs from inputs. And uh, we will come on later to the more expansive uh, variant of this. But everything is fields, because these are all three-dimensional um, fields in general. OK, here we have uh, actually this problem is um, the way we, this nanoparticle problem, which is ions between plates. And here's some other examples of where they're important. And we're trying to um, Predict the uh, behavior of, on parameters of the of the ions. This code is written in game hybrid MPI, OpenMP, C++, and we use a simple neural net to learn the results of this simulation, which earlier was bouncing around. And uh, we have um, three output values. This is the net, the network has. Just three output uh, floating point numbers, three densities. It has five input numbers, and it has um, two internal layers with 17 and nine um, fully connected uh, neurons in them. We trained this with uh, um, almost 7,000 configurations, so, um, which were selected as the good results from a larger number of simulation, and that's divided. Uh, 70%, 30% between uh, training and testing and validation. It's noticed that this is not a deep learning network. We're assuming that when we move to much bigger problems, we're going to lose deep learning. Either this is just the neural network. And we also tested all sorts of other ways of, um, of um, implementing this. And this uses Keras and TensorFlow. And, very, and the usual standard ways of implementing such neural nets. And here are some comparison of the different ways of looking at. So we ran these, taking these 7,000 runs and analyzing them in different ways to get surrogates. And the neural network is far better than any other method, 95%. As the success rate is based on the error in the machine learning calculation, probably 95% is actually sort of perfect. Because if it uh, can't be too much bigger than that, because the machine learning is uh, a few sigma, two sigma. And this is what 95% should be. So these are the three learned values, contact density, midpoint density, and peak density. And uh, it's between 92 and 90. 95% for each of those three things. And here's the mean square error, which is also small and much smaller than all the other methods. So there is, these are obviously not to work. And uh, the neural net clearly works. And it's very encouraging for future problems of this type. 
Uh, this gives you some uh, further uh, illustration of the success of this. Here we have these three things, peak density, center density, and contact density. And you plot the, um, once you've got the surrogates, you can actually calculate the value for any, any inputs. And so you can get actually a, uh, <coughs> you can draw lines, trends, and um, here we have the peak density plotted against the, the original molecular dynamics as a, for, uh, in this scatter plot. And as they're sort of totally aligned along y equals x, that says that uh, this illustrates the huge, the huge reliability of this method. Uh, this shows the important use of these surrogates, which is to get an idea of what the data looks like. Sorry, what the simulation looks like. And what the data produced by the simulation looks like. So here we have ion di diameter versus contact density. And so here we have the machine learning and the molecular dynamics, and they are all effectively in agreement within the molecular dynamics error, 1% typically. And um, here we have the densities against uh, salt concentration. And these calculations show very, very clear uh, dependence on the salt concentration of the densities. And the surrogates give very excellent uh, agreement with, with the uh, actual direct molecular dynamic simulations. But this is where surrogates are so very valuable. You want to look quickly at trends, so you want to have an ensemble. So you can just, just plug in values and just Rapidly experiment and see what uh, a particular thing and uh, output thing looks like. To do this really well, we're going to have to learn more than the three outputs we learned in this example here. But this shows the principle reasonably well. All right, here we can actually take classic parallel computing speed up formula and use it to calculate the speed up given by calculating surrogates. So that involves uh, several times the sequential execution time of the classic simulation. The, the parallel time run, to, which is used when you run the simulations for training. The time you spent per point in the, within the learning um, algorithm. The lookup time to run inferences. These are training times. The number of training samples and the number of lookup samples. And uh, the formula involves, uh, well, here we have n train, and that involves a training time and a learning time. Uh, T lookup times the number of lookups, and here's the, we have to compare this with the total number of runs, n lookup plus n train. So this is, a, as far as I know, a correct formula. Although the definition of speed up is um, not quite well, so agreed in this thing, we have to have some consensus in the community and maybe refining this formula, or at least interpreting. I think the formula is correct, but it may be not calculating what people want. And it has this dramatic effect because the lookup time is 10 to the 5 times smaller than the training time. And so you get huge speed ups. And uh, so if you t t take this seriously, then you're going to be able to get Z and scale performance quite quickly. Uh, and actually, there's another interesting feature. When we do parallel computing to do speed up, we have to use lots of cores to run the job. So that's a pretty computationally intense. However, to do the inference to look up a job, we just need one core, because the inference is running sequentially, and at least in, the, in these cases, it just runs real fast on a single core. So you get effectively another factor here of 128, because each, each lookup is running on a single core. All right, now we have uh, some more examples, which we don't have quite as many results yet on. Um, we have learning outputs from inputs, fields from fields I've already mentioned. that We start off here with the green are the initial fields. So those are the input to our network, and blue, the final values, are the output from the network. So that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. I don't think that's been done yet. And we need, we needs to be explored. It is quite non-trivial because of the large number of uh, points in the initial state and final state. And so it is a clearly more challenging thing to do with more training samples and probably much more sensitive to the neural net being used. What has been done is what I call case C, 
which is a variant of this where we uh, the uh, we we have the final state uh, measured, and, but it's only this is a bit of, this is not this ultimate calculation. This is a one-dimensional final state. It's a two-dimensional simulation, but as there's symmetry in the answer, we just look at one dimension for the output. It's defined over a over a circle, um, interior of a circle, and we just calculate it along the radius. And we have 501 values. This comes from this, this uh, paper from Duke University, Massive Computational Acceleration. And uh, it uses this, uh, this nice uh, variant of deep learning called LSTM, long short term memory. And they have the learning sequences, and they're trying to express the fact that uh, the one dimensional distribution is a sequence. Whether that's really necessary or the optimal approach is not clear to me. Uh, some, something we need to investigate. How do we learn things which are sort of linked? The space, if we have a spatial distribution, is linked, and that linkage needs to be expressed. And that's typically done through graphs or sequences. And uh, the, these, this particular paper used the learned network to predict, to, to be able to just rapidly predict the result of a simulation and do a giant uh, um, parameter sweep. And actually, the parameter sweep found features which were not present in any, any of the simulation used in the training. They verified these, uh, these, late, these features by particular top pitted calculations suggested by this. Uh, Learned uh, uh, parameter dependence. And this gives a factor of 30,000 improvement in performance. All right, so here we have the results of the, uh, of the spatial distribution with the 501 points. We have the comparison of the, of the neural network prediction versus the um, actual simulation, which is a PDE or couples are actually sort of agent-based because uh, it's a bunch of gene sequences, and um, you can see almost a perfect agreement within the accuracy of the representation of the figure. And these are meant to be not chosen for perfect perfection of fit, but just randomly chosen from the results. They show the Y variation in distribution and the uh, Uniform agreement between the, the network and the simulation. So this, I think, is quite encouraging and uh, is another step towards establishing this approach. All right. So the next, uh, this is the end of this particular part. We will continue our discussion of ML around HPC in the fo following part. Thank you.